Hello everybody and welcome to the Architects Bookshop Isolation Talk number 21. Tonight we're going to have Edition Office come and join us um, from Melbourne, but I just wanted to say hello to everybody out there. We had some really amazing contacts during the week. We had an article written about the Isolation Talks from uh, Edinburgh University, which is really fantastic. So shout out to the Edinburgh University. Um, and we've had a whole lot of contacts from people um, touching base to say hello from various places around the world. So if you are in a various place around the world, um, please chuck it in the, the live chat. And if you can, subscribe to the YouTube channel because it's super, super fantastically much easier for me to organize these events when you subscribe. It's really great. So hello to everybody. But importantly, Edition Office, Kim and Aaron, hello. Hi there. Hi, thanks for having us. Oh, thanks for coming. It's nice to have you both. How's Melbourne? It's pretty chilly at the moment, but, you know, it's getting there, warming up. I think there's a big uh, sunny forecast for the weekend, so I love get outside into our five-kilometre radius. Yes, because I love the fact the first thing you talk about Melbourne is the weather, not the fact that you're not allowed to go more than five kilometres. <laughs> <laughs> we, try, we try and speculate mentally outside our homes. Yeah, good imagine, good imagine. Oh, that's great. Um, it's kind of nice that you're about to open up again, apparently. Indeed. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Have you been have you been coping as an office while you're doing the lockdown? Well, I think much the same as many. Just uh, a lot of Zoom. A lot of Lots. online <laughs> Zoom. Yeah. A lot of managing young people running into meetings and yeah. That sort of classic thing, and but um, no, it's managing, been... when you say managing young people, you don't mean staff. You mean um, uh, children, yes? Indeed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it's 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 interesting. It's just a different way of working, really. And um, it'll be it'll be fascinating to see what happens at the end of um, COVID. Probably, you know, nationally here and worldwide to see if there's a big shift in um, working from home. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be intriguing to see what happens with our uh, with our kind of traditional CBDs. See what goes on. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, well, thanks for coming. We really appreciate having you on. You're, you're you're a bit of a crowd favourite. When I put out the call to say who should we have to talk, the edition office came up about you know ten times. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> that was very flattering. <laughs> and I, I'm like, I know those guys. I'm just going to ring them and ask them. Why not? <laughs> just ring and see. Would you come and do it? And you were like very gracious and saying yes. So thank you. Um, so for everybody out there, uh, I think one of the one of the reasons we asked Edition Office to come, uh, they're you know super superbly innovative as a practice, and have been doing some really remarkable work. I think um, culturally, trying to look at the relationship, or particularly trying to investigate things. I think architecturally around. Uh, Aboriginal Australia and white Australia and what that means and colonisation and so there's a lot of really interesting things happening in what they're doing. Um, as a bit of background to addition office though, uh, Kim and Aaron met when they were actually working together at Room 11 which was an office that uh, was originally based out of uh, Tasmania actually. They both uh, studied in different parts of the country so Kim in Newcastle north of Sydney and Aaron in Hobart and then they did their Masters RMIT and formed edition office. Um, so they're 10 people based in Melbourne. And without further ado, guys, over to you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Adam, and, and thanks, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, we, what we framed our talk, I, I guess what we really wanted to talk about um, with the opportunity, with, I don't know, under the Architects Bookshop umbrella is uh, the decisions as architects that we make every day and um, and why we do the things we do as architects and the outcome or the ramifications of those decisions. Um, so, the, you know, there's stuff of architecture. Um, and I guess with no further ado, um, just diving into some of these themes. Um, arrival or how you approach a building or um, and how it's you know, interactive within its site is something that comes up in every project, you know, relative to what context. Um, this is a house at the, you know, very late stages of construction, almost finished in kangaroo ground in the Yarra Ranges in outside of Melbourne. Um, it's a house on a wonderful, enormous site with a huge view, um, you know, out past the site boundaries. Um, and it brings up that, uh, that, I guess, need to understand how you arrive at a house from above. 
how do you how do you embed from into the landscape um, from that position? Um, the I guess taking a reference to the Sugarloaf Reservoir just over the valley and the client's really specific requirement that we don't destroy the hill in the process, um, uh, which is a wonderful requirement, a, a wonderful request that we, um, I guess, respect the integrity of the landscape and how we situate ourselves within it. Um, so the house burrows in, it kind of wedges in so that when you arrive at the house, you arrive at about waist height um, into this apex of that prow. Um, and that takes you down into this chute, this ramp within this rough sawn timber clad um, in a gangway into the house itself, peering into, I guess, a, an interiority off to the, off to the right, um, the pool that'll have its own kind of gal steel prow enclosure around it, um, and taking you down into a position where a single residence has that balance of a connection to the, the immensity of this broad landscape, um, both up and down the hill and across the site, but also the intimacy of, a, um, of an interiority in terms of a garden um, space uh, and an outdoor room that the house backs onto. So forming that balance point um, as, a, as a grand site gesture and as an intimate site gesture. Um, a similar relationship, but a, I suppose this different thought process is our federal house up in northern New South Wales. Again, this is a house arrived at from above, um, requiring that understanding of the house in, um, as more than just four walls or four facades. It has a fifth, or actually in this case, six facades. There's, a, there's an undercarriage that is also a present part of this house. Um, but this is part of our thinking here is, uh, you know, maybe it's part of our thinking of outsiders in Melbourne architects um, working up in northern New South Wales, but certainly part of our understanding of um, uh, being two architects with uh, white European heritage working in Australia um, is this understanding of um, occupying place. Um, and with that understanding of the house being seen from above, it means it's being seen as a as an entity, as this kind of foreign object within its context. So it has an absolute relational um, or um, a, a relationship to its landscape as something other. Um, and that's that triggered an understanding of it uh, as, a, as a whole thing, but with a certain a balance of firmness and lightness um, on the ground. In this situation, it kind of just very gradually floats off the entire site and then just continues to float on um, as the site falls away. And part of that thinking, I guess the silhouette you can see here is the almost, if you squint your eyes, that classic Federation house, this set, settler house. Um, the, there's a, and being on Bunjong country um, up in northern New South Wales and the hinterlands of Byron Bay, um, we see this, uh, you know, trying to change that narrative of conquest or settling or displacement of country and, and occupying a place um, delicately, temporarily. Uh, as if it's, the house itself is aware that it will be there for only um, a, a relative period of time, not a forever, but some time. And it's with, with permission, it's, it exists on that site. Um, that little glimmer of light you can see inside the house is um, the skylight down into a central kind of cloister void or courtyard that the house wraps around. Uh, and is also the front door. Um, the, this on the south and the western facade of the house these uh, large 200 by 50 rough sawn iron bark battens um, crack open to these interior inner streets, inner hallways or outdoor spaces, but I suppose within the realms of the house. Um, the For Our Country, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander War Memorial um, designed with the wonderful Daniel Boyd um, at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. Um, this is a project, um, I suppose how we arrive at it or people arrive at it, um, we, it was incredibly important, this, important to us that it was designed that you understand the starting point or the, the previous journey um, up to the arrival of getting to this pavilion of how we got here collectively and culturally. Um, the hill in the background, Mount Ainsley, um, was the site of an informal community made uh, war memorial which was separate to the formal war memorial site for indigenous aboriginal and Torres Strait islander diggers um, because there wasn't a formalized recognition of their service on the grounds uh, up until this up until now up until this um, workers occupied that site 
So framing the facade of this two-way mirror glass facade, um, both to the, the memorial itself, both to the, the sunlight, which has a very powerful relationship to, but both to an acknowledgement of its past, um, our, the, the collective past that this memorial is relating to. And carrying that idea of um, arrival or um, an, an understanding and a relationship to history, um, of, a, of a past before this present um, is in absence uh, with the work we designed for the NGV for last year's NGV Architecture Commission with Yuani Scares. Um, it has a, has a very cute relationship to the Roy Grounds building, um, an axial relationship to it. You enter through it into its gardens. Uh, there's a physical you know, balance between the two. Um, and actually, uh, I guess, you know, drawing a, a centre line underneath that big, beautiful water wall under the arch at the front of the building traces right through this crack, um, through the whole, this kind of cylindrical edifice of the work. Um, and that taking you into that void is taking you into this, um, I guess, false absence, this false understanding of terra nullius and, and also the, um, the, the idea of the removal or uh, erasure of Indigenous memory or, or just um, particular narrative in our national story um, that has been uh, written over or pushed to the side. Um, the conversation is absolutely about, or the, the work is absolutely about triggering conversation, about bringing those, um, uh, those collective narratives to the surface. Um, and here it is kind of highlighting that axial connection of, again, um, uh, the position it's relative to in the, I guess, that Western tradition of thinking and Western tradition of architecture that this project is a counterpoint to or in balance to. So uh, the next phase, uh, the next sort of category, I guess, is um, this idea of um, grounding. And uh, we have a, an interest in, in many of our buildings really linking um, strongly to the ground and and are interested in in the sectional qualities of of how we uh, inhabit particular places um, in the project in federal we were really interested in in this idea of balancing the lightness of the form uh, above with something that was um, really heavily grounded into the site and utilizing the nature of uh, the possibility of, of the pool program to to connect into the into the ground plane, and I guess in many ways it, it sort of talked around this idea of a gradient of shadow and and a gradient of um, respite on the site, but the the deeply sheltered pool space creates a really quiet, cool retreat um, counter to the the elevated area, which is really about breeze and light and and letting a lot of um, sort of, I guess, a sort of uh, more 360 panorama up in the, down in the, in the depths of, the, of the, the pool space. We were really interested in focusing the view and focusing the experiential qualities around that sunken nature of the site. Uh, the Mount Martha House, again, was sort of interested in, I guess, uh, using a flanking wall to to establish a ground plane and to to look at uh, look at the wall as a tool to provide a cartographical reference against the topography of the site and it's something that we we're really interested in um, broadly is, is is really tracking and tracing the original ground plane along the facades of our buildings making reference to them, making sure that they're that's really clearly read as a as a sort of historical and, and um, connective tissue there. So then um, the Point Lonsdale House, I guess, in count, countering the, the fact that this project's actually a really lightweight uh, beach house, we were interested in this really, um, I guess, internalised connection back to the ground plane and in this instance the bathroom provides a space of interiority and, and solitude solitude and away from the family gatherings and it steps down into the solidity of the footings and down into the solidity of the ground so really i guess in 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 reference to that ground plane using the the nature of of dropping down into the ground um as a as a 
as a tool to kind of amplify the experiential qualities of a particular place. Yeah, so I, I guess adding to that in terms of physical grounding, the idea of emotional and conceptual grounding, um, um, which I suppose is probably a, um, a lead into this element. This is a, um, a cast bronze earth vessel um, at the centre of the, the War Memorial in Canberra for our country. And this, this is in its open position. Typically, it's sealed and secured. Um, but in its open position, it creates an opportunity for elders, for a community from, from um, you know, the, all of the various Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations across Australia to bring earth, to bring country from their, from their site, from their, from their community, uh, and bring it here so that all soils and all country from the entire, um, all nations are brought here collectively. So the War Memorial is this. Um, acknowledging that it's on Nam Gambri and Ngunnawal country, but it's representative of all nations. Um, the the shape of this earth vessel um, and the depth of it, it, it goes down four metres into the ground, but it's um, because of the, um, the shallow diameter and, and the way this kind of curve funnels down into the ground, you can never see the bottom. Um, and it's, I suppose, conceptually referencing um, that idea of the it, it, that that void just continues into the depths of the earth it doesn't end it's this kind of deep intimate connection into the ground potentially similar to i guess in our mind's eye um the idea of walter de maria's vertical earth kilometer um, this idea of a kind of a brass circle that just goes right down into the earth uh, almost like you're putting your finger in your own in your navel um, there's some kind of intimate connection there um, the interior of that pavilion um, carries that same idea of um, of that shadow of being within the earth, um, almost being you know beyond the realms of I don't know the physics or the laws of physics of, of what the earth is. That you're kind of swept up in the idea of country in the in the in the mineral of it, um, in the sensation of it. Um, our Melbourneian apartment, uh, 14 stories up, looking over. Um, Looking over the botanical gardens, actually, you know, and also looking over the NGV, just um, around the other outlook. This is a, a renovation to an apartment building that had a, effectively a back and then an, an immense front of glass, just um, just a consistent arc of glass and view and sunlight um, that was overwhelming to the apartment. Um, what part of our strategy was to use the formal gestures of the new um, new spaces to actually use these curves to shape shadow to shape light um, um, to use the formal nature of the project and the spaces it contained to actually craft um, spaces of i don't know sculpting or positions against um, that light in in i guess in defiance to the the overwhelming nature of the light before there was a qualitative nature to it we needed we wanted to use light as a thing and add a, and add quality to it and add a nature of light um, and a nature of shadow. Um, back to the, the Point Non style house, the living room spills into this north facing outdoor room. Um, but understanding, I guess, thinking about those long summers, um, just opening to that space would be, we're trying to shelter it from, I guess, the heat, the intensity of the sun mode of, you know, a long summer afternoon, allowing that filtered button shadowy light to come through and, and the breeze paths. So to be connected to that garden and connected to that air, but be um, and connected to the natural daylight, but not in the sun, just celebrating that shadow in this interior outdoor space. And furthering that in the interior hallways of the Federal House, um, taking that idea of the battens and the filtering light coming through from the balancing the sun from the west, um, the idea of intensifying that idea of shadow, that idea of shadow in this black stain um, across the timber. Um, and that is parallel or, or I guess continued again in um, the interiority of in absence um, with Yuani Scarce and taking the idea of shadow almost as a viscosity, as a thing that has um, structure and weight and presence um, in the stillness that it provides you. If you go into a space of uh, I don't know, mental shadow, emotional shadow. Um, um, there's a there's a, a a gentle weight across your shoulders. There's an embrace of that. Um, certainly, a recognition of the um, the narrative that this project is um, is responding to. And as a, as a counterpoint to to that weight and, and and hurt of the past that this this project represents, 
uh, we use the, the dance and rhythm of daylight as an opportunity for deep listening and engagement with systems greater than our own. So the theatre of movement of the sun across the, the deep chambers and, and the nature of looking up and seeing clouds and, the, and, and those systems moving past really links into that idea of um, connection with those greater systems that uh, Indigenous communities have been uh, connected with for such a long time. Um, for our country, again, the, the work is an alive thing, so it, it has this constant relationship with the movement of light, and each day in the morning um, the sun floods the interior of the pavilion, uh, bathing it in the light of, of indigenous gaze and bathing in the light of that particular country and acts like a sundial as the light shifts and moves within the within the space. Art Bank is 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 using daylight in a in a particular way where we're looking at filtering the daylight and the archive as the centerpiece of the of the work is really about celebrating the value and weight of cultural wealth that it represents a collection of 40 years of contemporary Australian thought. And it it brings light in through this existing sawtooth roof into the studio space. Um, if we go back a slide just for a moment, Kim, I think I, I, mentioning that idea of the, the, the archive being in the shadow here and, and, and rested um, while the sunlight uh, drops down into the adjacent gallery space. And then moving on to the artist residence, we were interested in obviously amplifying the sunlight in that space, so bringing it down, deep down into the studio space and using the section of the of the project to bring light all the way through. And again, the Melbourneian, this idea of filtering the intensity of constant universal daylight and framing an interiority against the over, overwhelming saturation of of sunlight and and view and and that idea of the the curtain and the sheer um, allowing you to loop back on the space, loop back on the kind of intervention into the pavilion, into the um, the apartment, and really refocus that idea of interiority. Um, touches, yeah, it's like that you know classic, almost Alvarado, that <laughs> kind of um, displaying our nuts and berries roots from our undergrad days. Um, the things we touch in architecture or the, touch, or the things our clients um, and the people who use our buildings touch is really important to us. In this case, the, um, this, uh, the leather of the, um, one of the two, the desks of one of the two studies at our Melbourneian apartment um, that will, uh, has that, the warmth uh, and that ability to wear and, and age over time in balance to the, um, the carved solid granite um, of the walls of that space. Um, in our Hawthorne house, um, there's a lot of attention paid to um, how you touch the home in, in various ways. In this case, um, you know, so carved, you know, solid, um, simple uh, recess pockets in sliding doors, balanced with um, solid brass rods and um, as little cavity slider um, pulls to pull down the doors back and forth. Um, in the handrails, the um, the the uh, all of the, the, the handrails um, that you touch and the, um, I guess the joinery details are all sandblasted brass. So sa the sandblasting and the shelf on the right is sandblasted stainless steel. So that brings, a, again, a warmth or a softness for those um, solid metal elements that very, very importantly allows them to tarnish and patina. As soon as you sand, sandblast them, they become incredibly thirsty for, um, you know, for fingerprint oils. Um, and they, they age and they mature. At first, they just get covered in fingerprints, but within a couple of weeks, uh, and, and within a couple of months, there's this wonderful depth of shadow and materiality um, that they bring forward. In this case, uh, in the kitchen joiner, you can see all the, uh, this is after those first few weeks or the first couple of months of use. Um, this project was finished in 2018. So now those handles are much darker, much richer um, material. And they're simply just sandblasted brass extrusions, just angles back to back. Um, Coming back again to the artist in residence at our art bank studio, and um, there's just a mild steel solid round bar um, of 16 mil solid round bar. So something quite um, refined and simple um, in its detailing, 
um, with very just uh, raw and honest welds at the junctions, um, just highlighting um, the presence of what it is. This is references back to the idea of, of how we apply the materiality on that project um, using, uh, I guess, materials as medium in, um, in the same way that they are, uh, I guess you would see as raw material for any artwork, the, the medium before an idea is applied to it, the medium before thought, um, just the, the stuff itself waiting, waiting for that use, uh, waiting for meaning to be applied. Um, and the handles, the door handles to each of the bedrooms at our federal house, um, continuing this kind of, yeah, you know, interiority. This is an outdoor hallway about to step into an interior bedroom, but that um, just that so carved um, simple element, it's just a solid timber rod, um, acting as that, that pull kind of giving a weight and a rhythm and casting a shadow across that north to south in a hallway and balancing the, the rhythm and rigidity of the, the balustrading that um, is present within the project. Surface is, um, yeah, it's a really, it's one of the most exciting things about um, making architecture, I think, in many ways, this idea of um, the sort of vast array of possibilities with surface. And we got really excited um, when it came to this particular project, working with Dan and his 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 artwork and the fact that, that there was this really... Uh, intoxicating and kind of strange hypersurface of the glass facade, which we we had to do a lot of research into um, to enable its technical qualities and the and the functional qualities. The fact that you could, that it, the outside surface is this mirrored uh, these mirrored lenses with a with a ceramic black frit, which was to be matte, and then the fact that that had to be a two way uh, glass so that you know, you couldn't see your, yourself from the outside. You could see only your reflection on the outside, yet you could see that from the inside, the uh, the landscape, Mount Aisley, and the um, and the the memorial abstracted. But that that contrast between that kind of surface, which is alive, and when you walk past it, um, shifts and augments space. Uh, the contrast of that with uh, this mineral textural earthen uh, surface there was something really enjoyable about playing those two materials off one another and and looking at the ideas of of deep time and sun and space and past and future um, fish creek this uh, really sort of almost accidental i probably shouldn't say that but um, accidental texturing in some ways in that um, we, we had always had this idea of, um, of having a really uh, thick mortar joint to enable this sense of the hand across the laying of the bricks. But we had, a, had originally planned to paint this building white and allow the paint to kind of grade and uh, degrade, sorry, and, and kind of peel away over time so that the, the project would have this idea of, of aging and become a bit of a relic in the landscape. And once we came to site and saw the, what the, this sort of recycled brick um, with its natural mortar had become, we were incredibly excited and we were able to convince the client to, to just um, stay the course and allow the, the natural um, qualities of the, of the brick and the mortar to maintain there and um, I guess you know it, many in many ways it sort of breaks down um, and reinforces the objecthood of the house breaks down that sort of singular brick into a more monolithic object um, yet when you get close you sort of see the nuance of all those individual elements um, and, and again it really didn't it allowed that weathering to, to maintain um, and then uh, another recent project, which we haven't really we haven't really spoken about much um, to date, is is a project in Kyneton, which is a continuation of of that idea of of the textural qualities of brick um, and this idea of uh, reinforcing a sort of immediate relic or an immediate kind of uh, history or or a kind of um, weathering of of material. And 
I guess this this almost goes back to that first project in, that we were talking about here in terms of surface. This idea of this hypersurface in a way, and that um, we have a beautiful we have this beautiful star, and um, which is in itself really textural, but has become kind of something else in that it's been um, laser cut into these, oh, sorry, a water jet cut into these um, really voluminous curves and feels incredibly soft and, and subtle when you when you hand along it however it's this you know ancient textural material so the fact that it's been so highly machined is yeah there's something really intriguing about that as a surface the liquidity of it and the plasticity of, of it uh, as opposed to the kind of natural state that it finds itself in so this transmutation of, of material is something that's really exciting to us uh kim do you want to talk about this one yeah this is on um, the outside of point lonsdale house um and playing playing the balance between uh, the sharpness or crispness of the, the roof volume and the the coarseness of this rough sawn oil silver top ash with the um the precision of the steel painted frame you know window frame reveals that the to the right of the screen is north so you have this kind of hood um to the north of the site um, and, and we love that balancing of this. Um, as, I don't know, um, the language you're using tonight is that hyper, hyper materials are just incredibly clarified materials can, um, put together with materials that are really raw and will age and will, um, you know, uh, build in entropy into their, you know, into their surfaces, um, bring decay into themselves, I suppose, uh, in terms of the long-term view of it. And just if you go back to that one, Kim, for a moment, the idea of this project too was that we we had this um, super sharp steel reveals, really kind of crisp roof, and then we had this um, soft warm timber. But over time, this timber will go grey, and it will it will start to merge into those other materials, the greyness of those other materials, and and we will end up with something different, but kind of um, more monolithic in a way, less less planar in terms of the, the way that. The, the images read at the moment, the building reads at the moment. And and that idea of, of a building kind of shifting over time and becoming settled into what it wants to be is, is really intriguing too. Mm, becomes more of itself over time and kind of settles into place more and more as it weathers and ages. Um, continue that exploration of timber and, and of texture. And this is, you know, almost straight from the mill, rough sawn timber. Um, but with that black stain that changes it from what it is, it kind of has this wonderful way of othering it. It just becomes, it becomes texture and surfer. It almost, almost stops becoming timber. Um, but the way it strikes and works with side glancing light is, is something that we're really intrigued by. Um, this texture is, this is the, the outer fence of our Hawthorne house. Um, this, these uh, Oregon boards, uh, I think they were used four times on four previous projects, but they're the formwork boards for the concrete of the home. Um, and they become the backdrop, this kind of cinematic backdrop to the, you know, the, the garden, which is this, um, uh, I don't know, the element on constant display in this house. You have this unifying character of this, um, uh, of this fence running around behind the, the light and shadow and the movement and growth of the plants in the garden. Um, and this is the, the, um, the surface that it came on, which is it's kind of mirroring and surrounding. Um, but the concrete facade of the project um, was designed, we kind of specified um, uh, minimum five mil gaps between all of those boards. We specified aged and used boards, um, A, to, to minimize the waste in the process, but to allow that, uh, that slurry to slip through and create this self-shading, um, you know, parallel or continuing the idea of the Fish Creek House with this highly textured textured surface, which creates a, this self-shading pattern um, through its own um, irregularity. Um, coming to the interior of the project, um, celebrating that idea of um, imperfection um, of the material of what concrete does. Um, cherishing these moments because they soften the, you know, they make a, a, a house which is brand new, which is, um, you know, built and, and then occupied by a family, or, um, appear soft and, and aged um, immediately. It gives character, you know, character residue to the house immediately, uh, which is something we're always striving for. 
and that character residue is part of that Melbourneian apartment. Um, we stripped the the concrete columns, the existing structural concrete columns that were covered in plaster and painted. They used to be clean, smooth, white columns, and we stripped them back down to their concrete, um, raw concrete cells, um, kind of for the client's personal timeline, you know, like touching them back to um, where they, they, they're constant travellers and I guess the age of, um, you know, the cities of Europe um, and, um, and bringing that idea of, um, you know, a counterpoint of something, something that has, um, yeah, those raw textural qualities within an apartment, which is very hard to get, um, trying to amplify that as much as we can. Um, and the, the wonderful work of, you know, the, the beautiful woman, Yuani Scarce, in these hand, handmade black glass yams. Every single one of these is handmade by a range of different makers. A number of people who are behind these, and every one of these yams has its own personality. Um, uh, as a map, uh, as individuals, they have, the, they have a, I guess, a shoulder above and a tail below. They become person, personhood in some way, but as a, as a mass, they become this kind of, um, um, you know, adornment um, uh, around the space and they become alive with the way the sun moves across them. Um, so they're, they're almost sci-fi's, you know, um, out of time and out of place, these beautiful glass elements um, balancing with that, that textural curved him that kind of softens the sound and softens the touch. Um, then the walls of the, around the archive at, our, at the art bank facility are, just um, large mild steel sheets, um, kind of hot rolled mild steel sheets. Um, uh, again, celebrating that idea of the and the floor surface of this factory is an old. Um, it was an old printing press, so there are I think you can see some magenta ink stains on the floor that are all they're all cleaned up, but they're all present. Um, carrying that idea of um, unprocessed material um, always used in this project. Um, reinforcing and continuing that idea we spoke about earlier of just uh, material in its raw place ready to then be used and turned into thought and turned into a medium for conversation. Um, back to the Fish Creek House surface in terms of the ceiling. Um, we've, this is a form ply or a film face ply ceiling. Uh, it's black, uh, but it's never red as black. Um, because the way light hits it, 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 it bleeds light. So that's reflected green from the hillside, from the, you know, the, the vista is actually inverted and, and kind of, um, uh, I don't know, it's like sucked into the, um, the, the house as a really extraordinary way of um, graphically working with colour and landscape and abstracting it uh, for such a simple, simple kind of honest material as a, um, as a wonderful tactility with it. Um, the, yeah, so surface and stuff, but then the spaces, volumes, um, that we create, um, uh, are, are again, this kind of, this everyday decision of how we, how we give the opportunity for character and quality to space. This is our, um, cross house down in Rye, um, that we're hoping to photograph soon. Um, it's the interior of the project is, a, I guess, is cruciform of rough sawn timber um, framed within this, um, I guess, enclosure of these parallel blockwork walls, um, framing a north-south connection to the um, tea tree scrub um, down in its Mornington Peninsula site. Um, but the circulation, the way you move around the site is this universal free space under this kind of, um, uh, the program space is always under the bedrooms above, which are in this um, kind of lower, the ceiling wings above you. And in the corners, you, as you move around the space, there's this kind of pinwheel effect of this kind of double height vertical space. And they're always the unprogrammed space. The informal space is almost privileged. Um, yeah, it's just um, kind of wonderful experience of moving around and having this, um, this yeah, kind of hyperspace or continuous space as you circle and loop and loop around the house. Balance with the very the particular specificity of one space. This is the the, the shared living room of the Point Non Cell House. Um, it's a beach house for a, a, a great, you know a wider family. There's a there's a, a, a couple um, who are the 
I guess, the matriarch and patriarch of the family, the elders of this family, but their children and their grandchildren um, all come together. Um, they've had a history of a, um, the previous beach house on the same site. And this is a, is a wonderful identity that the family share around this place. And this room is the centre of that idea of that family coming together. Um, so the black buck um, flows up and the volume um, kind of lifts up in this house. This is this, you know, apart from that bathroom we talked about earlier, this is a space where you vol volumetrically feel, I guess, a place of gathering, uh, a place of coming together and as the centre for that home and the centre for that family. Um, a similar idea um, or similar use of volumes is that the interior, while it was under construction of the Kyneton house, um, uh, the couple had left a, the clients had left a, a large, very, very large property in the Macedon Ranges and to move into town, to move into Kyneton, which is a much smaller block with neighbours just over the fence. They brought a lot of mature trees from site, from their last site and, and wrapped it around this place. But in trying to balance their, their you know, that previous wonderful relationship with um, expanse of space outside the envelope of their building, um, we were able to celebrate and uh, for every room in the house, celebrating a vertical volume, a, a ceiling cap of space and light uh, so that natural daylight um, can bounce around that volume um, and, and allow that presence um, or uh, the theatre of what this place is relative um, to its, uh, the garden landscape um, around the perimeter. Um, creating volume, creating spaces to occupy and to receive back into, this is um, the space of rest adjacent to one of the studies at the Melbourneian apartment um, cut, pulled into that carved solid granite. Um, and the extremities of that same apartment um, outside of those, the, the, the stone spaces are for places of doing uh, kind of um, studies and ki the, the kitchen, the studies, the sleeping space. Uh, the spaces for being uh, are these timber volumes, I guess all the timber spaces outside of those um, carved granite solids. And the use of the, the linen is to give it a, an end point. Um, uh, I think we mentioned earlier, the apartment is this one consistent arc of windows and to allow to have closure, to allow um, that uh, the idea of the interior, interiority not to spill outside of the apartment, the linen curtains wrap around and close out those two, big, um, two ends and, and return you back, um, creating this kind of one singular volume within the apartment. And, and back to the paired chambers of in absence, um, the idea of creating volume or providing volume for the opportunity for it to be filled um, uh, both with the acknowledgement um, of narrative of shared narrative and the acknowledgement of shared responsibility um, for how to come together and, and view and talk to each other across and within that shared volume um, and move together as a, uh, as a as a whole addressing and understanding our, our privilege and our bias and, our, and the um, perspective of our lived experience and the perspective of others. Uh, alongside um yeah, you know, the, the the physical attributes of architecture and the, the idea of garden and the, and the idea of landscape are incredibly important to us and um, are are on equal par with everything else um, that we that we do with the architecture. The garden and the landscape are seen as 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 one and an, an integral to one another, and probably no more so than. Um, yeah, the, the Hawthorne House is probably the, the the best representation of that in some ways, or the most clear in in some ways, in that we imagine the the platform of the house as an entire kind of stage for living, and we saw the the shell of the the building as this very defined and um, clear um, sense of volume and and containment. Yet the ground plane as something that was spilling between that and spilling around it and and so and sort of bleeding through. So there's this blurring of, of of an edge condition in a way, um, which I probably I think I'm I'm, stra I'm straying into your topic on this, Kim. But um, mm. the idea of garden being very important to 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 that particular um, project and and consistent around the entire the project so that um, one was always almost, immersed in the garden yeah almost a singular idea the the formal qualities like the the formal object the building that you see is almost a medium or a framework for how 
then all of the spaces that you occupy are in relation to garden. Like the, the, how that, the, the form of the house is kind of a byproduct of how we've designed a house to be in relationship to garden. Um, mm. um, the, the, the kind of arches, are that, that idea of kind of connectivity, but also very gently gathering your gaze and so, you know, kind of bringing it down so you're not staring at the neighbor's house next door, but you're just gently focusing it back into that garden space so that you're forever within this kind of garden that drifts from the front of site to the, you know, from front of site to back of site, from side of site. Um, and, in, and in addition to that, that idea of uh, that, we, that we play with a lot of, um, of being within an island or a sanctuary once you're in, in, in your house, um, being removed from context, context in a way such that um, particularly, you know, I guess in, in the suburban and, and urban environments where, where you may need that, that release as opposed to uh, more um, open and expansive rural or semi-wild conditions. Uh, and in these spaces here, the, the idea of garden and uh, really reflecting uh, that sense of um, the, the relief from the context again, but also part of these, uh, I guess, light wells that form the upper container of, the, of this building and allow for an intense amount of privacy uh, while being able to, you know, walk around and not, not feel like you're being observed and or observing others. Um, this is the the void which in, in the federal house, which we're hoping will be full of man ferns very soon. Well, it is it is full of man ferns now, but they're yet to to grow to their full capacity. They are they're in in a stage of growing right now. But again, this heart of the project is is connected to garden and to landscape, and and talks about that idea of intimate views as opposed to expansive views. This is a um, this is a cheeky one because the, you're not seeing the garden now, but that void in the center of the house will. Uh, this photograph was taken almost a year ago, um, and the, um, we're hoping to photograph it later this year when yeah that that heart of the home will be full and and really lifting up. But the the space below in the middle of the screen is the pool underneath the house, and that central garden spills down, has its own topography that spills down into that pool and relates to that framed uh, landscape and also the framed sky, that inverted sky that you know comes into the water space, but the space to your left, uh, when you know, when we go back there, we'll actually be tumbling and spilling and overlapping with this garden, which is this is when it was an absolute baby. Um, you can see the the ferns haven't uh, sprouted yet; they're all you know wonderful thick green canopies now, um, coming to life and filling the interiority of that house and 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 framing that reference point um, to every room in that house that um, frame that you know, wraps around that, you know, close to garden. I think this is um, this is the point of contention with Kim and I, this image. We, uh, we have a love <laughs> and hate relationship with it. <laughs> um, but the idea is that um, we, we, we were interested in this um, outdoor living space connected to the garden and the way that um, I guess in many of our projects, garden and is is collated or or contained within the overarching framework or volume of the house and in this instance the walls that extend beyond the, the building proper and collect the courtyard uh, become that that garden slash outdoor living space with um with its waterproof amazing waterproof sofas yeah, uh, the the walls here of this house, uh, you can see that the mortar that it kind of um, raked, dragged, and mortar finish um, because it's porous. The water seeps in, and you're starting to get that wonderful aging and weathering, where it, um, you know where it changes, it becomes old very very quickly. Uh, but these courtyards protect the house from the really fierce Gippsland winds that run across the, the ridge line and that the, uh, of that site and allow the northern sun to penetrate deep into the, the three pavilions of the house that are wrapped and nursed within those textured brick walls. You can create these kind of, um, I don't know, um, I, Jamie Jury would call them outdoor rooms. <laughs> these spaces of uh, protection and respite inside with these um, gardens, but it's a practical consideration on this site because it's so windy, it's very hard to manage a garden on that site um, outside of the walls because they're so buffeted by wind. They actually need shelter to actually grow 
Um, the Edge. Um, I, might introduce, I might introduce this one because um, I haven't had a chance to speak about this beautiful facade of dams yet tonight. Um, edge is something that is a really central part of our work. Often we talk about buildings have a sense of singularity or a precision to them so that they are, or in understanding that they are in relationship to context um, and edge, that, that um, gap between you know, um, self and context or building in context is really, really important to us. In this case, this kind of otherworldly two-way mirror glass facade of, of dams is, it creates an edge bet um, as between this elsewhere space that we look into, the, the landscape behind you and, and yourself as a witness, as an audience here, is reflected on the other side of this lens, but it's othered. It becomes somewhere outside of time and somewhere outside of place and it, um, it sets up an empathetic opportunity for just for memorial, for, for collective um, commemoration, for personal commemoration, for um, inqu personal inquiry um, into histories and narratives and, and losses and sacrifice. Um, coming back to the Melbourneian apartment in terms of the relative edge to that um, carved stone granite, um, is the um, powder-coated steel bookshelves sliced into those mortar joints. Um, the fineness of them or the balance of them actually articulates, or for us, it articulates and traces the curvature of that stone and highlights um, um, you know, the, the sinuous shape of that carved stone. Um, in a similar way, that the that northern edge of the Point Lonsdale house um, adds that clarity. This is the port, that kind of uh, space you can see. I don't know, the, the left third of the screen is the, um, the, the, the pathway from the garden to that outdoor room um, and creates that um, edge of the site and that kind of thoroughfare um, from inside to outside. But once you have an edge, uh, I guess there's the idea of breaking it. And um, uh, the, um, I think one of the defining features of the Hawthorne House is that the concrete shell is this kind of um, really strong, it's the signifier of the house, it's the signifier of the presence of the house. But the the experience of the house is the this kind of erosion of outside to inside and this um, this blending of the outside spilling in and moving. The, the, the reason why we didn't have um, square corners of the glass is to again um, break down that idea, that idea of an edge to not give a point where the interior kind of reaches a corner and stops and start, that it, it's continuous, it's fluid in the same way that the horizontal transition of the interior floor to that eroded exterior concrete floor to the garden is um, consistent and runs through the house. So this is an idea of actually um, formulating that edge in terms of the shelter, but completely eroding it in terms of the experience um, within it. Um, the, the Point Lonsdale house from that shared family gathering space um, with a dining table that we designed and actually, in, in fact, we designed the dining table for the Hawthorne house as well, uh, but that's not this topic. Um, the four metre wall in front of you is actually a door. It's a four metre wide pivot door, which takes that sense of um, volume that we spoke about before and actually breaks it and breaks down that edge and spills it onto this outdoor space, um, spilling then onto the garden space out to the north. Um, and this idea of site and modifier conditioning object, this idea of the house as having that um, that singularity and edge, we're really interested in that um, specific boundary between um, this thing and that place. Um, and when we come inside the house, that specific um, interrelation between that place and you, this you know that um, this sense of being here and being there. And somehow by making it so clarified, by making that, um, um, I don't know, the aperture for how you experience that place so, um, uh, so precisely framed, it almost, um, it almost it takes it away from being a barrier and it opens up that relationship to that place. That's the end of our talk. Um, and we hope there's an opportunity for question time that we haven't gone on too far. Um, Adam, do you want us to unshare or what would you like to do now? Yes, thank you guys. That was fantastic. I appreciate that. It was a really uh, beautiful talk and I was going to ask some questions during it, but it was just had a nice flow. So I thank you. That was 